Welcome. We will now look into Nurture Normalization as an application of integral and finite ring extensions. The idea of Nurture Normalization is to realize any finitely generated K algebra as a finite extension of a polynomial ring in D variables. So uh, basically you have your K algebra that is generated by x1 to xn, say, modulo some ideal. This is your r. And maybe these are uh, a large number of unnecessary generators, so to speak, and a very big ideal. So instead, you want to choose fewer, say, Um, generators so that one the ring generated by t1 td is transcendental so this is just the polynomial ring uh, over these variables no relations but of course it's too much to hope for that this was would exactly be the algebra r so instead we want this to be a finite extension so in other words our r should be d variables that carry somehow the essential size and then some small finite part. The geometric picture is that when we have affine varieties they should project whatever that means on affine d space with finite fibers. So let us look at what this means in one example. So let's look at this coordinate cross and so this is our x prime and then we have x the affine line and we have the coordinate projection onto the first coordinate so the coordinate cross is embedded in a2 but this is really exaggerated right i mean this is a one-dimensional object fundamentally we shouldn't see it as something two-dimensional just because it's embedded in a2 but this causes problems because if i look if it were truly one-dimensional somehow, then when I project it onto this one-dimensional things, fibers should be finite. But here over zero, I have an infinite fiber, an infinite pre-image, and that's not good. But instead, I can do a linear change of variables to get this coordinate cross. It's exactly the same thing. I've just twisted everything. This is something you've done in elementary linear algebra. And now I have no problems. Now the pre-image of any point is finite. And this is the idea of neutral normalization. One further consequence that inadvertently comes out of this is we're finally able to close the gap in the proof of Hilbert Nullstellensatz. And we'll come to that in a minute. So what does the neutral normalization theorem say? We will be working over an infinite field, not necessarily algebraically closed. And the theorem says that if R is a finitely generated K-algebra, commutative and unital as usual, with generators x1 to xn, then there is a number d that intuitively we think of as the dimension somehow, and a finite ring extension from the polynomial ring in d variables into R. So there is this d and, and this polynomial ring is just a polynomial ring by itself and the ring extension is finite meaning that r is a finitely generated module even over this polynomial ring and the generators x1 to xn can be written as linear combinations of these t1 to td one remark to be made is that the theorem holds over finite fields as well but not this linear combination part. For finite fields, we need to tweak the proof a bit and replace these linear combinations as well by something more intricate. We will not go into that in this course, since anyway, we mostly use this when k is an algebraically closed and hence, of course, infinite field. Before proving the theorem, assume we have now established it, let's look at how we close the gap in Hilbert's Nullstellensatz. So what we needed for the Nullstellensatz was we were presented with this kind of object. It's an algebra 
obtained by a polynomial ring quotiented with a maximal ideal. And the statement was that this is a finite field extension of k. And we did not prove this, now we will. So uh, this satisfies the hypothesis of the theorem. It's a finitely generated k-algebra, and the generators now are called s1 to sm. And so therefore there will exist d and the finite uh, ring extension in this fashion. The claim is that d has to be zero. Pause and think why this must be the case. Well, d must be zero because when we take this ring and factor out a maximal ideal, r is in fact a field. And if I have inside my field a subring, then this subring must also be a field. And the polynomial ring in d variables is only a field when d is equal to zero. So in fact, this knowledge together with the theorem says that I have a finite field extension from k to my field r, which is exactly what I need. And this closes the gap in the proof of Hilbert's Nullstellensatz. Let's now prove the Noether normalization theorem. This will be done in three steps. The first step is the following. If you are given a homogeneous polynomial in n variables, non-zero, then there are a1 to a n minus 1, such that p of a1 to a n minus 1, 1 is different from 0, meaning that you can always find a non-zero of this polynomial with last coordinate 1. Homogeneous here means that all monomials have the same total degree. Yeah, what this means, so if you have a monomial, it will be of the shape T1A1 times up to TNAN. And this total degree, this is the sum of these AI. And so this, you require, is the same. Okay, so we'll prove by induction on n that this step holds. The case n equals 1 is the easiest. Why is that? Well, of course, it's the easiest, but why is it actually easy? It's because if you have a polynomial in one variable that is homogeneous, then it has only one monomial. So p of t1, this is just t1 to some power n, with the possibility that n is zero. So either this is a constant, non-zero, and then of course it doesn't vanish on one, or it is some power and then it doesn't vanish on one either. So p of one is uh, not zero. Great. Now, if n is greater than 1, then take p and write p as a polynomial with the first coordinate singled out. So write p as a polynomial pi times x1 to the power i. i goes from um, 0 to some number d. So, so you write this in the powers of this x1. Then the pi will be polynomials in k of, uh, sorry, this x i should be t i. And so this is a polynomial in t2 up to tn, homogeneous of degree d minus i, so that altogether this is a homogeneous polynomial. But assuming that, which we do, that this is not the zero polynomial, one of these pi's will have to be non-zero. And so by induction, so there exists i such that pi is not zero, and then by induction pi of some numbers a2 to a n minus 1, 1 is not 0. And note that these are uh, multiples of different uh, 
powers of T1. So they are somehow, they cannot cancel each other, these Pi in, in this polynomial. And then therefore, if this is true, then you can look at the polynomial P of T1 and then A2, A n minus one, one. This is a polynomial in T1. We are working over an infinite field. It is not the zero polynomial. So it has some place t where, t where it doesn't vanish. So this is not zero for some value of t1. So to be precise, I should rather write this for some a1 because this doesn't vanish. And now I have reduced the case to a polynomial over an infinite field with one variable. And then the statement falls. So I can always find non-zeros of polynomials over infinite fields. That's the gist of this step one. The second step says that if I am given p different from zero, then there are lambda and a1 to a n minus one, such that this polynomial that I produce in this way is monic in Tn. So at some point in the end, in later parts of the proof, I will need some polynomial to be monic. And here is how we produce it. So given our polynomial, be it uh, homogeneous or not, just that it's non-zero, we can do a linear change in a very specific way of these uh, inter indeterminates. So note that I replace t1 by t1 plus a1 tn t2 by t2 plus a2 tn and so on, adding this tn part, and I leave tn as it is. And then I add this, uh, I multiply by the scalar lambda. And the way to prove this is somehow to reduce to the homogeneous case, and then this lambda will be obtained uh, by, from um, the step one as some q of a1 to a n minus one, one inverse. That's why we needed it to be uh, non-zero. So we write, rewrite this thing so that we obtain this. The details of the proof are not very instructive, so we will just skip them. But the point is that given a polynomial, it's always possible up to such a simple change of variables and multiplying by an overall scalar to make the polynomial monic in one of the variables. And now we're ready to prove the theorem. So we'll prove it by induction on n. So what is n? Yeah, remember, we have our k algebra r, which is generated by x1 to xn. And we want to prove that we have a finite ring extension from kt1 td to r. So we will do induction on the number of generators. If there are no generators, then we just have the field and then we are done. The theorem is trivially true. If there are generators, but they are algebraically independent, meaning that they don't satisfy any polynomial equation together, this means that in fact, our algebra R is just generated by these with no relations. So this is the isomorphic to the polynomial ring in n variables. And then it is, of course, an integral or a finite uh, ring extension over itself. So we are done. So the main work is when we have a positive number of generators and they satisfy some polynomial equation for some non-zero polynomial p. Then we can make use of step two. How do we do that? We replace our generators x1 to xn by these y1 equals xn minus a, sorry, this should be a1 xn and so on. So the uh, sort of dual of this thing, we, we subtract where we add it. So our um, x1 will be related in this fashion and we leave yn as xn. Then our uh, algebra generated by 
x1 to xn is the same as the one generated by y1 to yn, simply because there is just this linear relation between them with coefficients 1 in front of the yi and xi. So this is equal and yn is integral over um, y1 to yn minus 1. Why is that? Well, we want to show that it satisfies a um, monic polynomial and this whole tweaking business made it so that we can use step 2 and see that yn in fact satisfies this monic polynomial and so therefore this is an integral ring extension and therefore this is a finite ring extension of one variable less. So by using this monic the last variable when we add it we get something that is integral over the previous and by induction the previous part was already finite over kt1 to td and so therefore the theorem follows by composing finite over finite is finite. Now you might think hang on a second but this is some sort of infinite descent argument so by the same reasoning I can say okay but then yn minus 1 is integral over yn minus 2 and below uh, low, uh, terms below and so on and in the end everything will just be an integral ring extension of k yeah but the important thing is that this was assuming that there is such an algebraic relation at some point we will lose the existence of an algebraic relation we will have truly transcendental variables and by the way i realize that i have mixed small k and capital k they denote the one and the same field k and this concludes the proof of the Noether normalization theorem